So as people, people are com coming in, uh, so as, as I said, the, the next, uh, next moment is, is going to be a conversation with me and Dr. Todd Boyd. And um, as people are coming out, I tell one, there are many stories I could tell. Um, <laughs> but I will, I will tell you, uh, I'll tell you how we met, uh, which I think Todd would tell the story exactly the, the same way. And it's, it kind of kind of tells a lot about this whole sports thing and, and this professor life, too. So I, it, some of you know, I was in LA before I went to, uh, uh, to Wharton. Been there for years, grew up, you know, Crenshaw District, all, all that sort of stuff. So, and that remains where most of my friends are. So I left to go to University of Pennsylvania. And if I would come back home, if anything, somebody, if they understood at all, they said, how's Penn State? I mean, they would really no kind of grasp of where I was or what I was doing. And then, uh, and this, this is kind of for, for Bill Roden, then there was an article, just a little highlight thing, in Jet Magazine, which may not mean anything to everybody. Uh, but it mentioned my name, had a picture. And I came home, a barber shop, barber, everywhere. Everybody had seen it. And, and they, they knew who I was. And so then one guy that I got in high, high school with said, well, I know a professor too. You should meet him. And I said, oh, OK. Uh, uh, who is this? They said, well, Todd Boyd. And I don't mean this to sound the wrong way, but, but I, he said he's a young professor and, and this and that. And I said, well, why would I want to meet? Why would this black guy think I want to meet a Jewish professor? What? What in the world? Who's this Todd Boyd guy? So he said, uh, uh, "Let's go meet at the." He said, "Let's go have breakfast at, at the Serving Spoon." Anybody from LA? Which then got me all confused because that's a South Central LA kind of kind of haven. And then of course, uh, Dr. Boyd walks in, and uh, the the rest, as they say, is is history. Uh, and he was uh, at at. Sort of the, the beginning of his career at, at, uh, in Los Angeles, just kind of post the riots in LA, which was kind of an interesting moment. The first LA riots that I was not a part of, as a, as a, you know, a part of, that I was not in, in town for, um, having been there for the, the previous ones. So uh, Dr. Boyd is the Catherine and Frank Price Endowed Chair for the Study of Race and Popular Culture and professor of cinema and media studies at the University of Southern California. So to get all, all that right. The author, uh, author of uh, multiple books, and, and most of you, even if you don't know at the moment, once we start talking, you'll realize that you've seen him multiple times on documentaries. Um, the, the one other thing that I will say, you know, as a result of that meeting, it's, it's such an odd thing that, that uh, this random brother put us together. We ended up writing a book, which nobody has read, but a book called uh, Basketball Jones, which we'll talk about some uh, today, which has really become, I think, much more relevant in the moment. But it's a book we wrote maybe back in 2000 or so. Uh, so we, we will talk about that. But, but my, my favorite uh, uh, kind of piece to, to uh, if you get a chance, go back and look at the motion picture of the wood. And if you haven't looked at the wood, look at the wood. And if you don't blink <laughs> in the, in the uh, end, there is a minister performing a wedding service who looks very much like this gentleman that's about to, about to come up here. Uh, Dr. Todd Boyd, come on up. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. So we are uh, relatively unscripted. We have some, some direction to head in. And, and you know, we've been talking about this race and sports stuff today. And, and at the beginning, I said, you know, foundationally, we looked at throughout the year as a global sports institute, we looked at, at 1968. And we did a lot of programming related to 68 with Carlos and Smith and, and the like. So 
the show, I was doing my, my homework thinking about you. So if, if 1968 was Godfather part one, where are we today? That's an interesting question. Um, and is that, if, is that an accurate? If, if that's an accurate analogy. <laughs> but I think, I think it is. Um, to think about that question, um, uh, anybody who knows anything about me knows that uh, The Godfather is uh, a central part of my existence. And even more so than The Godfather, Godfather Part Two, because uh, Godfather Part Two is actually one instance when the sequel is better than the original, and the original is incredible. Godfather Part Two might be the best film ever in any genre. We can talk about that later. Um, <laughs> but that said, 1968, um, Carlos and Smith. Is 68 Part Two? Uh, 68, is, I, I mean, Jack Johnson might be part one. Okay. Um, because, and we were talking about this uh, in relationship to something else last night, but 68 might be part two. And I would like to say maybe this is part three, but the thing is, Godfather part three is trash. Um, <laughs> it's terrible. So we don't want to make that analogy. <laughs> Uh, Francis Ford Coppola went 17 years without doing a third part. He didn't want to do it, um, but his uh, cocaine habit demanded that he go back to work, and uh, he made <laughs> Godfather Part Three. So I don't want to uh, uh, mischaracterize this as Part Three, but I like that. No, no, you're responding to the question, though. No, I think, I think, I mean, it, it, it's it's fitting together. I mean, we, we've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out where where are we today, and this is what you get two professors up front and they know what each other is talking about. It, it is, so how do, you, how, do you think, how do you think these guys are doing today? Then the relative to, if it's not part three, I mean, it's not, right, not right. trash. It's not, certainly not trash. I guess I would characterize it like this. So if we think about Jack Johnson, Jack Johnson's era, um, you know, the height of his era, I guess, between like 1908 and uh, 1915, uh, if you haven't, I would encourage you to check out uh, Ken Burns' documentary, Unforgivable Blackness, which is uh, excellent, uh, as well as a documentary uh, Jim Jacobs, who was one of Mike Tyson's managers, did on Jack Johnson back in the early 70s. That one is especially um, uh, important because it has the music by Miles Davis, which he also released as an album, uh, tribute to Jack Johnson. And Miles, of course, writes the liner notes to the album a tribute to Jack Johnson. The idea of Miles Davis writing liner notes to an album about Jack Johnson is just like just beyond words. That's such an incredible statement. So you think about Jack Johnson being so far removed, but you can't talk about race and sports without talking about Jack Johnson. You can't talk about race, sports, and American society without talking about Jack Johnson. But that's a leap from that moment to the 1960s, which I think of as Ali's decade. But by the end of the decade, around the time Ali's being exiled, being forced into exile, this is that moment of uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith. Let's back up, back up for a moment for, for, for the audience, and, and I guess for me to make sure I'm in the same place as you. Why, why do you put Jack Johnson at, at the beginning of the, the Pantheon? I think um, you think about the beginning of the 20th century, I mean, his time uh, in 1908, Jack Johnson defeated uh, Tommy Burns. He becomes the first uh, black heavyweight champion. Uh, you know, there had been a color line in boxing mm -hmm. uh, like there would be in baseball. And then, of course, there's this moment when the media goes about searching for what they call a great white hope. Um, and that great white hope uh, turns into a, a gentleman, a Jim Jeffries. Um, and Jim Jeffries ended up getting it the same way Tommy Burns got it. Uh, Jack Johnson, uh, in his regal style, uh, taunting them and you know beating their ass at the same time. So when you think about Jack Johnson, someone known for driving flashy cars, for the way he dressed, um, you know, of course the controversy around him involved his dating of white women. This is in the earliest part of the 20th century. And so if you think about just what would happen in terms of 
say, black athletes from the 60s forward, you inevitably had to go back to that moment with Jack Johnson. Um, so I, I think I call Jack Johnson the, the, the sort of patron saint uh, of black athletics uh, because you can't really talk about race and sports in any kind of historical context without recognizing the importance of Jack Johnson. Obviously, a lot happens between 1915 and 1960. The more noted examples people would bring up would be somebody like Jesse Owens at the Olympics in 36, uh, Joe Lewis, uh, the Brown Bomber representing my city, Detroit, um, you know, and, and the way in which figures like these individuals, Jackie Robinson breaking the color line, um, becomes part of a national narrative about, uh, say, race in a more mainstream sense. Jack Johnson is more of a kind of controversial figure relative to the mainstream because he's antagonistic. And we can draw a straight line from Jack Johnson to Cassius Clay, who becomes, of course, Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. And what we're discussing in the 1960s, I think of as, you know, Ali's decade. But you also have, in some ways, the descendants of Ali, which would be Carlos and Smith, also in this same uh, era, guy like Kurt Flood and what Kurt Flood would do in terms of, uh, um, you know, free agency. Um, and, and, we, and we were talking about litigation earlier, you know, the precursor to, to Spencer and, and Amanda and people Spencer. like that, one of the first, first cases. In here? He was, I saw him earlier. Yeah. Um, you know, another one of the figures from that, you know, Spencer Haywood, of course, another Detroiter, my man, um, and the way in which he, you know, challenged the system and, and set in motion guys leaving college before their eligibility was up to go, to, to go make a living uh, playing professional sports. I think of that as a generation. So um, you threw it out there, you know how I do. Um, I come from a, you know, environment where jazz was always a sort of central creative theme. So you take uh, idea and you riff on it, a jazz musician never plays the same song twice, right? So if we think about Ali, uh, Tom, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, Kurt Flood, Spencer Haywood, et cetera, um, I think of that as one generation. The second generation, maybe this goes into your, you know, Godfather one, two, and three. The second generation, I think in many ways kind of in, evolves around the emergence of uh, Mike, Michael Jordan. Um, that's got to be part, that's got to be part three. I mean, in terms of this is so maybe we're at four or five. <laughs> <laughs> the, numbers, the numbers keep going up. I, I think As it gets worse in four or five. Is there... It gets better, though. Okay. It, it dips and then it comes back. OK, <laughs> because Jordan, you know, all his success uh, as an athlete, as a uh, endorser of products, OJ, I think, has to be in the conversation right. because OJ was, before OJ was accused of murdering people, he was, you know, doing Hertz ads. Uh, well, long before. Long before, <laughs> uh, or at least if he was murdering people back then, we don't know about it. Uh, um, I, read a, I heard a story about OJ pulling a knife on somebody when he was still in San Francisco because they took his locker. Uh, so, um, but this is OJ the star in the 1970s and particularly his ability as a football player, but more importantly, what he represented with the endorsements he had. Right. And this idea that you would use black athletes to sell mainstream products. Jordan capitalizes on it, but Jordan's controversy comes in when in the 90s, uh, people are trying to get him to endorse Harvey Gann, who's running for mayor, I'm sorry, running for the Senate. He was mayor of Charlotte, running for the Senate against the notorious Senator No Jesse Helms one of the worst individuals in human history. Um, Michael was asked to participate in the uh, uh, campaign against Helms, and he said, you know, paraphrasing Republicans by sneakers too. And I think that's the next generation. This idea that your sports success and the money you make is more important than any kind of political activism or social justice and a desire to be quiet and make your money as opposed to using the platform for something more political. But then I think in recent times, really if you start with the killing of Trayvon Martin back in, what was that, 2012, 2013, um, and you know, LeBron and uh, all those guys on the Heat you know, took that picture and posted it on the gram. 
uh, when everybody was, you know, recognizing what happened to Trayvon. And then, of course, right after that, you know, uh, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, this list of names that unfortunately right. we've had to memorize of people being killed at the hands of police and a guy like Derrick Rose, you know, wearing a I Can't Breathe t-shirt on the court. Um, all that leads us into Colin Kaepernick. And so I think what we are seeing now is kind of interesting to watch the way a guy like LeBron moves these days, right? Um, you know, the Lakers are playing a game in Utah. Uh, last night, LeBron's hanging out at Nobu in Malibu, rocking his John Elliott like sneakers. Um, he's sending a message to Magic and I think the rest of the world that he's at an evolved status where he doesn't have to be concerned about playing the role of the dedicated athlete. He's his own man. And I like what he has been doing with that status. But I think this generation is really, in some ways, a throwback to the generation of the 60s. But in other ways, the benefits that they have, the money that they're able to make, the way the culture has changed um, means that we're at a point now, I don't want to know if we want to call this part three, four, five, or six, mm -hmm. but I think if you look at it that way, this is a generation of athletes who recognize their visibility and that they can be something other than just athletes and they want to use the platform available to them to influence society. This wasn't something that was possible for Jack Johnson at that time, it didn't exist. And of course, for Ali um, and Carlos and Smith, they had to, you know, Spencer, they had to pay the price in a way that basketball, sports, popular culture, these things are accepted and embraced now. And I think it's important that the individuals in these positions recognize the power and the influence they have. There's nothing wrong with, you know, selling sneakers. I love clothes. I got a closet full of sneakers. I'm the original OG sneakerhead. Anybody who <laughs> wants to do battle, um, you know, hey, I'm there. I love it. But you can do that, and at the same time, if there's something that you can do from your position that helps shed light on something that's very important, political and conscious, you can do that as well. So, so let, let me change up a little bit. We certainly come come back to to that. But I mean, I, I appreciate the kind of tying together the, the pantheon and, and, and where we are and, and, who, and who these guys are today. I may want to talk about LeBron a little, little bit more, too. But let's, let's shift and talk about, we haven't really talked at length all day um, at, at about ownership much. And I'm, I'm just throw out uh, two names and you take us wherever we need to be taken on this. But, it, but in this moment in time where uh, guys are suspended, guys lose their jobs. Then we have Robert Kraft, and we have Larry Bear. Um, are, are they being treated as they should be treated in this, in this space of the power that athletes versus owners have? I think, I think that's a good question because the media focus is always on the athletes. And if an athlete does something that's considered wrong for whatever reason, um, you know, the media is going to take them to task. And, um, and I get, I get, I just throw this in there while, while, you're, while you're answering. You know, to some extent, I guess we're trying to do a scientific experiment. We would need two black ownership interest people having similar Right. Events. And that's hard to do because <laughs> other than Mike, um, there are no black owners, um, which is kind of part of the point, I think. Um, it's interesting to me, the name I would throw into this, which is not as recent, but it's still fairly recent, would be Donald Sterling. And Donald Sterling's role with the LA Clippers um, I mean, there were rumors about Sterling for a long time before anything was ever done back in 2014. Um, this is a guy who is paying a settlement in a housing discrimination lawsuit, right. but he owns an NBA team. I should point out uh, the current uh, so-called president of the United States 
also paid a settlement in the housing discrimination law scoop back in the 70s. Hey, man, and you're in Arizona, man. I, I, know, I know where I'm at. <laughs> I know where I'm at. Uh, I'm not in Cali. I know that. We, we didn't hire security. Be, because man. because I, I know, I know, I know, I know. Because if I was in Cali, I would have been much more assertive. <laughs> I, I, I kind of toned that one down. Um, um, two cats named Donald. Uh, both of whom you know, <laughs> paid settlements in housing discrimination lawsuits, yet it did not prevent them from reaching the heights of society. I think the thing is, you know, if owners were held to the same standards as players, it would be a very different conversation. But a lot of times, I think we have a resentment towards athletes in our society. People feel as though an owner should be able to do whatever it is they want to do because they, quote, own the team. But they never recognize the fact that athletes own their talent. Um, and so you think about Kraft and uh, some of these other individuals, these stories get attention in the media, but it's nowhere close to what happens with an athlete. And I think it's an obvious uh, double standard. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to make a direct parallel, but, but, but Bob Kraft uh, involved the incident that he's involved in a massage parlor and human trafficking associated with that. And, and pick your domestic abuse case. Again, I'm not trying to make equivalencies, but for ball players, that's today, that's just about the end of the day. Yeah, that's the end of, you know, I mean, there's going to be severe punishment. Right. And depending on who you are, um, you know, I mean, look at the cat from the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, you know, I think it's great that there's more awareness about domestic violence and these things and uh, people being held to account. But here's the issue, if I can maybe take it mm -hmm. in a different direction. Um, I am a professor in the number one film school in the world, have been for the last 27 years. Now, I say to people all the time, these people in Hollywood, they do all kind of shit. <laughs> all kind of shit. I realize I'm in Arizona. Uh, I realize that, but I, I, you know, I can't change my game up too much, just you know, not in my usual space. Long, long as the grenades are not used, we're okay. <laughs> we should be okay, though. I, I'm, I'm toning it down. Um, Man, I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? <laughs> <laughs> you keep fucking with me. Um, <laughs> I think the place I was going with that was <laughs> when you I, I got to. We, we were trying not to drift into this, but but something occurs in the news, and, and some of you may have this. You know, other professors may have this. So, especially, I mean, you do as a professor. Professor, try to find somebody that thinks about the issues, too. So we end up talking about a lot of, you know, all, I know the answers to all these questions already, you know, in, in, in some ways, right? I, I have a pretty good feel for where they're going. Well, uh, well part, of what, what part of what is interesting about this conversation is uh, we've known each other for a very, very long time, as he said in the introduction. And we talk a lot. Um, the conversations take up a lot of time. They're not short. <laughs> we have to schedule them. The only thing that's different about this is normally it's just me and him. And now we're doing this with an audience. So I have to look out at you all <coughs> periodically and keep reminding myself that, you know, we're not sitting at a bar drinking <laughs> single malt scotch um, or we're not on the phone, but we're in front of an audience. So the drifts in and out uh, have to do with, you know, the Censor friendship that censorship. we have and the number of times <laughs> we've uh, had these conversations. Um, I think the place I was going was if a athlete is accused of doing something that's considered wrong, it becomes a major story. And there's always this sort of underlying component to it. What are we going to do about this? They need to be punished. There needs to be something done about this. It's always lurking beneath the surface is this narrative of black athletes run amok. And there's an attempt to try and contain this. Now, Hollywood, entertainment, also very visible community of people, movie stars, uh, uh, musical artists, what have you. All the same sort of things that people associate negatively with athletes go on in these spaces, but I don't know of anyone holding these individuals to the same level of account. 
I don't know. I have no idea how much money George Clooney makes. I can tell you how much LeBron makes. I don't know how much money Brad Pitt makes. But name your, you know, black athlete, and I can tell you how much money they make. The point is, people in this society, in a lot of ways, still have a resentment towards the success that black athletes have had in our culture. But it's not acceptable to say publicly, I resent, the flag, I resent the fact that this black athlete is rich and in my face. You're not going to say that. Instead, you come at it sideways. And you try to use all these uh, uh, instances and say, well, this person, I love how they say it now, he has, quote, character issues. Now, it's dangerous to start judging someone's character, particularly if your character ain't shit. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So when I listen to people talk I, about so-and-so's character. That's, that's in the Bible, isn't it? So. I, <laughs> maybe not say it that way, but that's where it comes from, yes. Very much so. Um, <laughs> it's like, you know, character issues. Is he a character? Pro so much is embodied in the way we talk. So much is embodied in language. And language is so interesting to study, but you can say a lot without saying anything. And in many cases, these athletes are sort of held accountable in ways that I don't see for other people in equally prominent positions throughout society. So if you bring that back to the owners, it's like, I remember reading, this was a few years back, Mark Cuban you know, owns the Mavericks, and Mark Cuban likes to act as though he's a fanboy. And there's stories of Cuban like saying you know, derogatory things to players on opposing teams during the game. Now, what are you supposed to do? I mean, it, it even takes us into the situation of a week or so ago, Russell Westbrook right. um, in, in Utah, and uh, you know, this guy feels as though he can say whatever. Russell's standing on the court. He doesn't see him as a human being. He sees him as an object, almost like he's an avatar in a video game. Uh, had a situation a few months back, a cat named Marcus Peters uh, plays for the Rams at the Coliseum, and some guy on the sideline was talking, and Marcus Peters decided to walk off the sideline up into the seats and address this guy and let him know, um, you know, I can take this uniform off and, you know, we can throw these hands if that's what you want to do. It's like you're talking about human beings and people are talking to them like they are not human beings. And then the human being responds and it's a problem. So, you know, I've always said, um, we've talked about this also, this is the era of analytics in sports, right? You take numbers, you reduce human performance down to numbers. My thing is manalytics, okay? Manalytics. I'm interested in, in this case, I'm talking about male athletes, but you could apply the same to, to women athletes. I'm talking about figuring out a way to deal with the whole man, someone's humanity. Like, who are these as people? And how, what are we doing to develop them as human beings, as functioning, contributing citizens? Not how do we maximize their performance, which that's part of the business, but I think if there was more attention paid to how we go about using sports as a way to develop competent, contributing, uh, upstanding citizens, it's a much better outcome than sitting back waiting for somebody to make a mistake so you can pounce on it and criticize them and say that they have uh, low care. Right. So, so, the, so the clock has ticked down. I, I'm going to steal. I done two, talked up all my time. I'm going to steal two more, <laughs> two more minutes, though. I'm sure it's a violation in some kind of way. It's I, your gig, though. Come no, on, no, man. No, you no, you no, the man. No, but there's one question I, I want to ask you. I don't, I don't want to put this, I want more, more put this in the atmosphere 
and I've, I've mentioned it to Bill, I've mentioned it to, to Scott Brooks, I think I may have mentioned it to you. Uh, and I just, just uh, you know, at the reception tonight, m maybe people want to talk about this. Um, is there such a thing as unconscious bias? I mean, that's not, and that's not me, that's Dr. Harry Edwards asking, asking that question. In this day and age, can anybody claim really that I didn't know I was throwing two black guys out of Starbucks and I wouldn't have done it to two white guys? Is it unconscious, or is, I'm gonna answer my own question, is, 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 is it a, is it another layer that we don't need? You know, I think- Two, two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> That's hard, man. That's hard. <laughs> um, and closing remarks, as you <laughs> All that. <laughs> all in <minutes>. one. <laughs> so he wants me to put 10 pounds of shit in the pound bag. Okay, let me see if I can do this. <laughs> it's hard, though. I talk a lot. Professional I'm documentary. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I talk a lot. <laughs> I think that it's going to take longer than two minutes, but not that much longer. I think, you know, um, a lot of people would not want to admit that they have any bias towards another person. Because we don't, you know, it's sort of like, this is how I answer that. Um, it's like when somebody brings up racism, particularly if someone accuses someone else of racism, the society we live in, it's almost now like it's worse to accuse somebody of racism than it is of being a racist. If you wanna fight, call somebody a racist and you're gonna get a fight. Whether or not they're racist is irrelevant. You're gonna get a fight because even racists don't wanna be called racist. <laughs> they wanna be called alt-right or whatever. Like, they don't wanna be called racist. That doesn't mean they don't wanna be racist. They just don't want you to call them racist because racism is, at least in language, socially unacceptable. So what we have developed, I think, are these multiple layers around why something can or cannot be racist. And it often goes back to this thing of intent. Did so-and-so intend to be racist? And I hate that. This is what I'm gonna close with. I hate that thing about intent has nothing to do with it. Because what you're saying is, unless somebody consciously within their mind decided to be racist towards someone else, it's not racism. Well, let me ask you this. How do you determine intent? We have no tool available to us to determine someone's intent. The example I always use is this. If you get in your car and you're driving and someone runs into your car, there's an accident. Hopefully there's no physical damage. There may be property damage to the car. And you get out of the car and, you know, you're having a conversation with this person. They hit you and they say, you know, I'm real sorry. Um, I was checking a text on my phone and I didn't intend to hit you. But my car still has a dent in it. And there may be physical damage from that accident. Now maybe you didn't mean to do it, but there's still the impact of what you did. One, I cannot measure your intent. Two, whether you intended to do it or not, an action took place and damage occurred, right? So the thing is, unconscious bias, you go into a, a Starbucks and you say, can I use the restroom? And they say, restroom is only for paying customers. And you say, I don't need to buy anything. I already have my water or whatever. And then the next thing you know, the police show up. Now, we talked about this. I'm going to be brief, as brief as I can be. <laughs> I'm old school. <laughs> okay, now the way my parents raised me, and I'm not saying this is a model for anybody else. Trust me, it's not. But it is what it is. It's like my mother, she's famous. You go someplace, you get a lecture before you get out of the car, all right? 
when we go in this store, you don't want anything. <laughs> and she didn't say it like that. It was much more R-rated, <laughs> right? Well, I talk the way I do. You don't want anything. She done told me what I don't want, right? When we go in this store, you don't want nothing. Don't ask for nothing. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about, right? right? <laughs> you will get a lecture. Now, I got tired of hearing them lectures. I lecture for a living. I got tired of listening to them, so I decided to do it myself. <laughs> and then I got to be a certain age, and I'm like, you know what? There's a point to what she's saying. If I go in this spot, I'm not going to ask them to do anything for me. Because if I ask them to do something for me, let's say, and I don't buy a drink, I feel like I'm opening the door to be discriminated against. Not that the discrimination is right. I just don't want to face it if I can avoid it. And I don't need to die on that hill. I don't need to prove that point. So I'm going to buy something, and if I need to use the restroom, I just bought something, let me use the restroom. Now if you want to be funky, um, we can you know, talk about the fact that, oh, you don't want to let a black man into the restroom. I bought something where I can't. I don't want to have that conversation, right? So I guess the point is, yes, uh, unconscious bias, I think, is so present in our society because we live in a society that has never really ever fully dealt with racism. Racism is like a bad word. You're not even supposed to bring it up. So if you cannot talk about it, you can never deal with it. And subsequently, we got a bunch of people walking around who think, Unless they put on a Ku Klux Klan uniform, they can do any and everything under the sun. And if you call them racist, you're wrong for doing it. So it really is an a overall societal issue that I think gets manifest in an example like the Starbucks thing you bought up, but it's like so much bigger than that. See, the, the other thing, in, 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 in conclusion, <laughs> what his mother would say, you went all around Robin Hood's barn to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, as I always say, uh, taking this from Robert McNamara in The Fog of War, do not answer the question that has been asked of you. Answer the question that you wish had been asked. Of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Hey, thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, go on, walk. So, so next, thank you, uh, Dr. Boyd. We'll, we'll continue that conversation, obviously. Um, so, so next, uh, a, another conversation that, that, that uh, will take us, take us that much further um, will be led by Dr. Victoria Jackson. Come on up. Our our very own history runner, NCAA champion. Oh. <laughs> I didn't realize. That. My, my good friend. And um, she is going to have, hopefully not a similar conversation, <laughs> a, a differently enlightening conversation um, with Howard Bryant. And, um, you know, much, much like uh, many of the people we've had up here, I, I don't know. Which pieces of his of his life to highlight? You see, you see, kind of the the places where he anchors himself, and and then he'll go in isolation and work on on the next book. I think we're on book book nine or, or so now. But uh, you know, the life of of, of Hank Aaron. The, uh, uh, if you want to know about the juicing in the game, kind of just just a series of, of very insightful books. And you know, one of the few people to win, I think, two of, of, of one of the most prominent baseball writer awards available. Um, the, the, the thing that, that uh, you know, Howard and I were once on an NPR show, I think it's the first time we really heard each other talk, and I said, well, this, this guy actually reads this stuff. I mean, he actually had, you know, I don't even remember what the topic was, but just real insight on, on whatever it was, we were on for an hour. Um, and I said, okay, this, this guy, is is for real, and uh, if you if you want to start off and and, and sort of understand uh, what how Howard writes and thinks, uh, do read the Heritage. If you have not read that book, and, and we thought it would be appropriate to kind of uh, close out the one on ones with Howard, looking at that book, Todd and I talked some about kind of the progression of uh, that, that led up to Kaepernick, and um, Howard does so 
and, and it's a whole other element we haven't even, haven't even touched on uh, in terms of military and other types of issues. So Howard, uh, enjoy your conversation. Maybe she'll be kinder on you than I was on Todd. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not drunk. <laughs> Great athlete. I'm not drunk. <laughs> it's the photo. That's what it is. No, Shrop, that photo will not leave me alone. That's from 2009. No earring. It's all gone. <laughs> it stays. Hi. Hi again. Thank you so much for coming and joining us with this conversation. Um, we. Uh, just for those who weren't in the room earlier, Howard and Amira Rose Davis, a professor of history from Penn State University, had just this exceptional conversation. I literally just handed it off and they riffed off each other for like an hour and it was beautiful. So I, apologies to those who did not get to witness like serious knowledge dropping and history dropping by uh, Dr. Davis who's over there and Howard Bryant up here, so. <laughs> So for, th for those who have not read, had the privilege to read The Heritage, um, I mentioned earlier also, I, I, I'm a historian. I teach uh, sports history, which is a trick. I use sport to teach history. And so I assigned Howard's book in my class. And students loved it so much that one of them um, decided to do an independent study on the history of black athlete activism this semester. Um, so it, it's, it's that moving of a book. And it, it's really... It, it speaks to how sports history is American history, and um, especially the role of athletes in the long black freedom movement and freedom struggle and the project of American democracy, which is ongoing. So if you could, uh, maybe to open, um, for those who haven't read The Heritage, explain the, the main thesis of the book um, as yeah, a starting point. Well, I mean, I, I know that uh, Dr. Boyd and, and, and Schropp already talked a little bit about this, but I think that what I was trying to get at really were the twin, the sort of combination of what was happening today. I, I refer to it as the post-Ferguson black athlete colliding with post-9-11 America. And especially when we're talking about what took place, and I see Bill Roden up front as well, during you know, that period when you came up in the business where you had this gap, post-Carlos, post-Smith, post-Ali, where black athlete had disappeared from a political standpoint. What happened to the black athlete and what brought them back? And I think that to me, uh, you have to start thinking about, when you work on a book, you start thinking about, how do I wanna tell the story? I have the, what I refer to as my uh, five steps of anxiety when I work on a book project. And so we can only deal with a couple of them. But the first one is, do you have an idea? And obviously there was an idea here. Obviously something has been happening in the culture. Then the second one is, can you get it? How do you want to get this idea? What is the way to get it? So for me, I think there were two things that really stuck out. I think the first thing was the hostility that black athletes were facing post Trayvon, but especially post Ferguson, LeBron, Kaepernick, et cetera, in that this notion of stick to sports, shut up and dribble, stick to sports. And I think that it's one of the more, if not the most ahistorical argument that people can make. The black athlete has never been afforded the ability to stick to sports. In fact, one of the reasons why the black athlete didn't stick to sports was because white America demanded that they not stick to sports. If you go back to the, the 1936 Olympics, why were black athletes involved in this? Because both the Jewish athletes and the white American press wanted them to be up front to denounce Nazism and to say that we've got it pretty good here. Why did Paul Robeson, why was he attacked by Jackie Robinson? Because white America asked Jackie Robinson to denounce another black athlete. And so there are so many examples where the political black athlete was essentially birthed by white America. So the idea of stick to sports was nonsense. And not only was it nonsense, it was insulting. The, the second part of it was in the how do you want to get the idea. It was how do you want to tell this and where did it go? And to me, I thought that the story should be run through three, three players that, uh, that Shrop and Dr. Boyd had already talked about. I think it starts with OJ, Michael, and Tiger. I think that this is where you start to look at who were the leaders and who were creating and which athletes were creating the template. O.J. Simpson is obviously, he is America in so many different ways when we start talking about 
the the rise of the black athlete, you know, race and society, all of it. And so it was him followed by Michael in terms of the commercialization and the the financial imperatives that came when when Michael and Nike and that corporatization in the 80s came along. You had a real a decision you had to make if you were going to be a black athlete, if you were going to really question what was taking place and what was going to be the financial price. And then, of course, the third was Tiger, where Tiger did something that neither OJ nor Michael did, which was to not just take the commercialism and recognize that, but then to just sort of erase the racial element. At least OJ and Michael both understood the value of being black. Tiger realized, and, and Nike didn't want this. Nike was like, no, 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 it's really important for you to be black, to, in, 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 especially in golf. The, you know, Nike sells stories. They sell inspiration. They sell aspiration. So it's, it's America's greatest bedtime story to be told that there was a black athlete in a predominantly white game who overcame it. That's what America wants. And then here comes Tiger saying, no, 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 I'm not black at all. And they're like, yeah, you are. We need you to be black. So to me, I think part of this story, when I started to think about this, you started to realize that I make the argument that in a lot of ways, what is being sold is that in the um, American sports milieu, being black is treated as the worst thing in the world. What happens to any black athlete who advocates? They'll take everything. This, and this is something that you would think would have been a 1968 story. It's a 2019 story. And so we start talking about it, and this is one of the reasons why I have this really interesting area, and, and we talk about black athlete power, we talk about LeBron, and we talk about Kevin Durant, and we talk about all of these things, and all these athletes who now have so much power. But how much power do you actually have if you lose everything for talking? So I'm not quite sure where we are right now, even though it's obvious that the players have money, I'm not sure how much power they really have. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to quote you to you. Um, and you might that. be pushing back against yourself here, so mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll see. Um, because, because LeBron James kind of throws a curveball in this yeah. to, to a certain degree. Um, and it could be us willing what we want onto LeBron James, but I don't, I don't think that's necessarily the case. And quite a while ago, I, I believe it was Dave Zirin, um, who I use in class, who kind of poses this question about LeBron James, who kind of aspirationally wants to go the way and become a global icon for social justice and human rights in the vein of Muhammad Ali. But he also wants to get paid, as he rightfully should, in the vein of Michael Jordan. And so Zyron poses this question. And, and I think you would say we're at a point where LeBron James has shown you can be both. Um, and, and not in a way where your message becomes co-opted even to a certain degree. So here's where I'm quoting you to you. You wrote about LeBron James. He's given cover to the athletes without the talent or bank account to be more vocal politically. And he's sent the message that being politically active should not be radical, but commonplace. So um, if you could maybe use that and push back against yourself or continue that argument forward yeah, I about think LeBron. They, I think they both hold because they, I think my point is I'm not, sh I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think that part I'm very sure of because I think that imagine how different things would be if LeBron came out and said, yeah, I don't think it's okay to kneel. And I don't think that this, you know, if, if he did what Tiger does, I think we need to respect the president of the United States. If he backed away from everything, then all of those other athletes would be exposed. That's, I have no doubt about that. My issue when I talk about power and LeBron is more, it, it's, it's as the athlete, as individual corporation grows, mm -hmm. can you protest yourself? You're the boss. <laughs> You're now the leader. You, I mean, you look at, Lebr look at LeBron's corporate ties. I mean, anybody who's trying to make a documentary today, you gotta go through LeBron's people at Spring Hill. Every, they're the ones. So it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens to the one role that LeBron has in terms of being that athlete who, who gives people the sort of power and the inspiration to challenge what's taken place in sports. And also what's gonna happen when he does one day own a team or owns a, or owns a league or whatever, because he's got that much power. So it, it's, 
So he's moving in a direction, he's moving in opposite directions at the same speed. And so to me, what ends up happening is, is it doesn't necessarily become a LeBron James power issue, it becomes a labor management issue. And at some point, you cannot escape labor and management. What happens when the players become the boss? And I think that I was glad when, Shrop, you brought up the, uh, the Donald Sterling thing. I remember in the Heritage, I talked to Carmelo Anthony about this. And Carmelo believes that the athletes missed a huge opportunity in terms of this power struggle, that they shouldn't have turned their jerseys inside out and thrown them in the middle of the court before that playoff game. They shouldn't have played at all. And imagine what they did, he says, the, the, the missed opportunity for them was in trusting the new commissioner, Adam Silver, that right then and there, they should have shut the game down and said, now deal with us and see what happens. But they, they went up to the edge and then they decided to trust the power. And Carmelo's point was, if we're really going to get somewhere, we're going to have to cross that next step. We're going to cross that next line. And so we'll see if they get there. You know, and I, I think a similar conversation is taking, I know, I know we're not talking about the collegiate space, but I, I do think, uh, you know, people have been kind of signaling that if there is going to be something that reforms collegiate amateurism, it would be, you know, a boycott or a walkout we saw during in 2016, the Final Four or the yeah, playoff. With Missouri. Play. Yeah, Missouri right, just scratched absolutely. the surface. Absolutely. And you saw what the players could do. I remember Don Yee called me after that, Tom Brady's agent, and he said, look, you're, you're, this, is, this is Missouri. Imagine if it were Alabama football. Imagine if it were Duke. Imagine if it were one of the really, really big programs. The players have the ability to shut the entire game down and create something different if they want to. The question is, do they really want to? The, um, before we shift gears, the second part of this is the, the global awareness. Mm -hmm. Again, kind of willing things on to people. You know, LeBron James has um, uh, ownership in one of the English Premier League clubs, um, a par partial ownership. He's been hanging out with Castor Semenya. And that, to me, is something that's been missing from this generation, is that global awareness and um, kind of global connecting pan-African identity shared, right, um, that we saw with Jack Johnson that, you know, in the 19 teens, that we saw with athletes in the 1950s and 1960s mm -hmm. as well. And so again, kind of willing things onto athletes now. But, but to shift gears, um, the, the other part of what you do so well in the heritage is the, the other side of this, which is um, what happens after, after September 11th, 2001, and um, the ways in which patriotism and militarism and sport become conflated in certain ways and, and on the other side of athletes who are also working on a project of American democracy, which is gaining full human rights, and, mm -hmm. and that this is artificially in conflict, that this divided American moment becomes exacerbated, exacerbated uh, most explplicitly uh, on on sporting fields. So if you could speak to that a little sure. bit, well, please. and especially uh, absolutely. I think one of the things that that struck me over the last several years, and I didn't quite figure out what was happening. But once again, when you talk about, do you have an idea? There was an idea here. Post nine eleven, the ubiquity of the American flag at sporting events, the ubiquity of police at sporting events, the ubiquity of uh, induction ceremonies and all of these different things, the flags, the flyovers. Usually we saw that during the Super Bowl. We saw that during the 1990 Super Bowl with the Giants and, uh, 91 rather, the Giants and the Bills, the, the Whitney Houston Super Bowl. Within three weeks to a month or so, even leading up until the NCAA tournament following, and the Gulf War was over, the ground war was over in what, 42 days, something like that. By the time that ended, all the flags and all the flyovers and all that except for championship games were, were done. If you go back and look at the videotapes of the championship with Duke, they all had American flags on their jerseys. By 1992, they were gone. The Super Bowl, they had all the American flags that they were waving during the game and the players had the American flag on their helmets. By the next year, that was all gone. September 11th, they were there and they've never left. It's been ratcheted up more and more and more. And I think part of the reason, obviously, is that I think that the, the Department of Defense has recognized that this, as a moment, is an unbelievable recruiting tool. I think about this in terms of our generations. My dad, which was kind of hilarious, 
to this day, well, not to this day, until I was in high school, I was in high school, he would not buy a Japanese car. And, and I was like, yeah, but you want a Volkswagen. You know, that was his, you know, he was a World War II generation. He did not, he did not buy a Japanese car. For me, I'm, you know, I was born in 1968. I'm a Cold War kid. This is what we remember. We remember the Olympics was the United States versus Russia. This generation, it's the 9-11 generation. What they remember more than anything else, that, that moment has shaped their lives. My son is 14. He's never, he's never seen peacetime. We've been in war 18 straight years. So when you look at what that's done to sports, the, the government has recognized, and of course, you know, the late John McCain and Jeff Flake recognized this and exposed it during the paid patriotism report, that this is a, this is a fraud. You're watching the government essentially use sports as a recruiting tool under the guise of patriotism. It's not patriotism, it's commerce. And so to me, what I found really interesting about this was that you're selling patriotism at a sporting event at a time you're telling black athletes they can't speak. And so you're essentially criminalizing in a lot of ways the most patriotic thing you can do, which is to speak in this country. And so to me, that was the thing when I watch sports, why you see it so differently now. Um, you look at the, uh, of a 365 day calendar, there were 130, I think, law enforcement appreciation days at any sporting event across the, uh, across the calendar. It's a third of the year. And so this is happening at the same time of, of Trayvon Martin. It's just the same time, it's happening at the same time of Ferguson, where you go to a sporting event and you are expected to genuflect and defer to law enforcement at, a, at the same time you have athletes who are saying, no, we want to fight police brutality. So suddenly, you going to a game to get away from your problems, no, 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 your problems are following you at the ballpark. When you buy a ticket, this is, this is the battleground now where it's all taking place. I had a wonderful conversation that I used in the book with, um, with General uh, Russell Honore, who was fantastic in the, in the cleanup in Katrina as well. And I said to him at the time, I said, well, you know, my son is, is 12 years old and uh, I'm not sure I want him to go to a Red Sox game and be recruited by the military. I think I want him to go to the game and enjoy the game. And he said, well, I tell parents this all the time. That's too damn bad. He says, we got to recruit them sons of bitches as, as early as we can. They man the force. And if it so turns out that some 12-year-old watching the Dallas Cowboys game who is inspired to serve his country when they see an F-14 flyover, if, they, if that forces them, if that makes them want to serve, then that's what we need to do. He says, military recruitment is down 10, 20%. And we can't get this kind of advertising anywhere else. You've got 80,000 people at a football game. Where else can we get this kind of advertising? So they're not even hiding it. That was the one thing about this that I thought was really interesting. It wasn't like this was some sort of great investigative piece that I dug up. They're not hiding it at all. It's right in front of all of us. Well, and what I really like about the book and how you frame this all is that historical lens um, and connecting this back to the, the need for and the use of the black body versus the black brain. Because we want your black body to serve. We want the black body. And that, body. by the way, includes the military as well. well it, it's the same. They're the same people. One simply has enough talent to make $80 million, and the other doesn't have enough talent. They simply need to put themselves through school. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so kind of a not so smooth transition here because I think we're at our end of time. But um, you took all my time, Shop. Thank you. Uh, right? <laughs> you know, I was going to say Fog of, Fog of War was a great movie. I said, Can I reclaim my time? Can I reclaim my time? Yes. <laughs> Look, there's a. Exactly, right? Look, here we go. I got it back. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to give you one more question. Okay, I'll be brief. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you like to see happen in your world? If you could control the future, what would you like to see happen? Two, two things you'd like to see. Well, I'd like to see some citizenship. I think more than anything else. I think that I would like uh, people to sort of recognize when they are being manipulated. I'd like them to fight a little bit against that manipulation. I think that we live in a time of images. 
and those images don't have nearly as much value as the depth. What do, what do these words mean? What does democracy mean? What does freedom mean? What does any of this mean if you take somebody's job for disagreeing? What is any of this? It has no value to me. I think that's one of the, um, the most important things. Um, I think the second thing, especially from the sports standpoint, is I do wonder what we're going to do as we move in further and further. This is the ultimate victory of the dollar. And we, there, there, it is an onrush. There's sort, of, there's sort of no way out. It almost is like when I was working on my, my steroids book back in 05. And Bill, you know this. You heard it a million times. Well, you and Barry, too. You would have done the same thing for $20 million. And so if that is your measure, it's essentially um, integrity in a time of cynicism. What do you do with these concepts if, at the end of the day, everyone is willing to excuse themselves for the dollar amounts that are out there? I don't know the answer to that. I would like to see some form of correction. I don't know if we're going to get that. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you uh, for that conversation, Victoria and Howard. And Howard, we're bringing you back up in just a minute, man. So you're going to... No, uh, we'll bring you back in just a little bit. Uh, right now, we're actually transitioning. We're going to bring up Ilham uh, Hronewald. Uh, and I'm not going to speak too much about her, her introduction right now because it's going to be part of what we, we, we speak about. And then... Uh, we'll transition in just a moment uh, after we have a little bit of a conversation and bring up uh, Daniel Birdsay and bring Howard back up. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, you got to grab your, your, <laughs> your mic. So, they'll, they'll know that you're probably not from around here as you, you begin to speak. And I, I didn't prep you with these questions because I've, I wanted you to be able to think on your toes a little bit. Um, we go back some years now. I want you to tell us the story, right? So I'm, I, you know where I'm going with this. You were asked what you aspired to be, which your dream job would be what? Well, in 1993, first and foremost, thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm from South Africa, and I want to give a shout out to Vuyo. So I'm not the only South African here. And he's a freshman here at ASU. I told him, finish your degree and I'll give you a job back home. <laughs> <laughs> so I worked at the political studies department at the University of the Western Cape. I started there in 1991. And without going into the detail of the South African history, in 1993, uh, my boss was Dr. Vincent Mapai, who became a personal advisor to Tata Madiba. So in 1993, I answered the telephone call as a secretary, and there's this voice on the other side, sounding like Nelson Mandela. And I said to the gentleman, with due respect, I think that it's been, you are very disrespectful to imitate our president. And the gentleman said, um, well, young lady, I am the president of South Africa. And I said, with due respect, sir, I do not have time for jokes. Can you please introduce yourself? He said, young lady, you have a funny accent. I said, well, first and foremost, if I have to explain myself, English is not my first language. And then he started laughing. I went ice cold because nobody can laugh like him really. Because right at the end, he's got that, there's that, that laugh that, you know, nobody can imitate that. I called my colleague, Mark. I said, Mark, it's Matiba. And I called him, for, he said, you're talking nonsense. And then I, I breathed and he said to me, what's your name? And, but he spoke in Afrikaans. And I gave him my name, and he asked me, how old are you, where are you from, 
How long have you been working for Vincent? And tell me a little bit about yourself. And I'm still not sure if this is really Madiba, but I, I, I told my story and I said, well, I grew up in the Platteland. I came to the city. I became a student activist in um, 1988. And that's where my journey started in politics. So I do believe that I contributed to your release from jail. And then he laughed again. And he asked me, um, so before you transfer my telephone, my call me through to Dr. Vincent Mapai, what's your dream for South Africa? I said, well, first and foremost, like thousands of other South Africans, I'd like to have a cup of tea with you. And he said, let's see about that. Let's see how powerful Vince is to organize that. I said, and the second dream is that I would like to become the Minister of Sport of South Africa one day. So that's where it all started. So how many of us can say that we've spoken with anyone near the level of a Nelson Mandela? So I, I think, I love hearing this story. I've heard it before, but I wanted to make sure that, that they heard that. That's obviously an amazing uh, story and, and experience. And you started as a secretary there at the yes. University of Western Cape. It was your Absolutely. first post yes. as a head athletic director there. And now you are, and, and we should speak a little bit about uh, the University of Western Cape as uh, Bill Roden has talked to us about coming from an HBCU. Tell us about the uh, UWC. Well, um, when after the elections, uh, Nelson Mandela put together his cabinet and about 60% of his cabinet came from uh, University of the Western Cape, which, which says quite a bit about the institution. Um, I didn't start my journey at University of the Western Cape. I actually started at the then Peninsula Technicon. That was basically two institutions separated by a, by a railway. Yeah. So that was back in, in 1988. And then I started to work at UWC in 1991. The history about UWC is a very strong one in the sense that at the then Peninsula Technicon, the police could not enter that particular campus, but they could enter the University of the Western Cape. So you can imagine all of the activities that happened back then at, at University of the Western Cape. So as student activists, we deliberately chose UWC as a venue because we understood the impact that whatever we did would have um, either in the Western Cape or across South Africa. And the reason why we did that was um, we knew that media would always find its way where there's a, a, a much stronger story to tell. And that stronger story, if that's how I can word it, would always be um, attached to the, the unrest, you know, uh, students um, taking it to the streets with various political leaders. Um, the perhaps also a point of interest is the, the different political parties back then. There was a very strong colored political party called the UDF. United Democratic uh, Front. And that was led by um, Dr. Alan Busak. And, and that's really how I, I got pulled into the politics. And with the then Peninsula Technicon and the University of the Western Cape, they, they took hands to, to fought the struggle together. And Ken, you uh, quoted uh, um, Desmond Tutu. So one evening they locked up some of the students and Desmond Tutu went with us to, to jail to go and release the students. And so as he walked in and he started to pray, our father, the policeman basically told him to shut up, believe it or not. So there's a bit of a story around uh, Desmond Tutu. So in terms of UWC and my journey, Scott, I worked at UWC for 23 years. So I started as a secretary, left, in, left the political studies department in 1999, where I then joined the athletic department. So I stayed there for quite a long time, 23 years. And I left UWC in 2014. Now I can proudly say- As the athletic director. As the so athletic from director, secretary to- From secretary to, to an athletic, athletic director. Uh, director, which was quite an amazing uh, journey. And in between, I joined the workers' union. I headed up the secretary's forum. I said to them, you, got, you need to do something. You can't just run an office. So I politicized the secretaries at the University of the Western Cape. Um, led a very strong workers' union that transformed the space of the University of the Western Cape. 
And I want to bring this debate back to 2015. So what happened, a, a very critical incident happened uh, in 1997, 1998, when hundreds of people were retrenched from universities, when higher education decided to basically privatize certain services. If you go back to 2015 and the Fees Must Fall campaign, it brought us back to where it all went wrong in 1997 and 1998. Mm -hmm. And so, Bill, you spoke about the young people thinking that what they're doing today is history. And I think, um, on a more positive note, what the students did in 2015 was really to create their own history. And the reason why I'm sharing this, Scott, mm -hmm. I think that transition from UWC to Stellenbosch University, mm -hmm. it was a painful one specifically for some of us that, that, that had moved around among certain universities. So in 2015, I found myself at Stellenbosch University and in a space where I truly believed that people that didn't understand. And a lot of people didn't understand why I left. And I remember how shocked you were when I told you yeah. that I went to Stellenbosch University. Well, yeah, so UWC is essentially a historically black yeah. university. It was, you know, the university, as uh, Ilham has spoken about, where Mandela and others had famous speeches there in, the, in their stadium. And so when I visited with you there in 2013, I'm, I'm at this university where there's the archives of Robben Island and, and all of the activities that happen around sport in, in the prisons. Yeah. And then Stellenbosch is in the wine country, and there's nothing but white people. And so it is a very different space when I, when I see you. And, and even going back and speaking with the colleagues at UWC first, there was this question of whether or not you had sold out, right? So Absolutely. why have you left, left us and gone to you know, this place that has so many more resources and are white? But you had a different plan. And that's, Absolutely. You know, that's, that's one of the other things that I... I have such profound respect for you because of how you think of your, your, your mission and your goal, right? And so you, you talked about wanting to be the minister of sport. And as a woman, to be an athletic director in our country is rare, right? To be an athletic director in your country is even rare. And then to be a woman of color, the first colored woman at a historically white university, right? That's, it's unheard of. And so, you know, it, it is an amazing story um, that I have come to know and, and appreciate. And you and I have talked about, you know, we, we talk about race and inclusion here, diversity and inclusion. And I remember you laughing, <laughs> right? And, and saying, what is this diversity and inclusion? And you brought up transformation, which I now use, uh, use a lot. So tell us about this transformation and why that's different from diversity and inclusion. So for us, um, diversity, inclusion, gender representation is as a result of transformation. So there's a number of things that you need to do so that you are inclusive, that your space are a lot more diverse, that you do create more opportunities for women. So in 2012, um, South Africa accepted a transformation charter and it went through all the different levels. And there are six dimensions um, um, within the charter. The first is demographic representation. The second is about access. And access is about creating opportunities as well as having the necessary facilities. The third dimension is about um, capacity building, empowering people. The fourth dimension is about performance. The fifth dimension is about community development. And the last one is about corporate governance. So if you look at all the six dimensions and what are the focus areas for a number of our sport federations to focus on, you will, or there's a requirement that you are more diverse, that women are included, that black coaches are included, et cetera. So what a lot of the national uh, sport federations did, they developed their own plans around this, the, the sport charter. And the minister then also appointed what is called an eminent persons group. And this is a group of people that annually evaluate the progress of transformation on the big codes. And they are, right now, the most controversial one, uh, rugby, followed by cricket, uh, football, netball, athletics. Now, 
an interesting question asked around football uh, or comment made that you don't have enough white people playing football. But that argument is flawed. Why? Because white people were never excluded from playing football. Right. That's, that's, right. that's a very important point. Right. We never told white people that you are excluded from football. Right. And with the, with the uh, democracy and the unification of sport, 25 years later, we still can see the damage. Because the reality is, some of these sport organizations just decided not to transform. Yeah. And that's the fundamental difference for us. Um, in the States, you talk about the Rooney Rule. Mm -hmm. now, now, what is interesting about this Rooney Rule, it says you have to interview people for head coach positions. Not in my country. You don't just interview black people for the sake of interviewing them. So we have what we call an Employment Equity Act. It's an act that actually requires of you to not just interview black people, but to appoint black people. So when I started at Stellenbosch University, it took me 18 months to get to know the space, and I thought there's something wrong here. And then I put together a, a human resources plan that speaks about employment equity. It took me two and a half years, only two and a half years, to transform my department. And the human resources practitioner asked me a very strange uh, question. Where do all these black people come from? <laughs> I said, really? 92% of our population is black. How can you ask me a question like that? So, so when you tell us transform, give us an idea of the percentages so that, so that we really have a picture of how in two and a half years we could make a difference. And specifically in terms of the university? No, so the, the athletics, so coaches and your, your student athletes. So when I started at Stellenbosch University, um, I asked, um, does anybody have a database that gives me an idea of how many athletes, the demographics, the gender? And the response I got back, and I was still in orientation. So the university has this system where you are three months, you're in orientation before the current person leaves the job. And so the then director was handing over to me and I said, what do you mean you don't have the information? It didn't exist. So what it meant to me was they didn't care. They didn't care about black athletes. Again, that was a very quick job. I think I got the job done in about a week. Uh, less than 10% of the students participating in sport at Stellenbosch University were black athletes. And that was worrisome for me. So in 2015, I then wrote a proposal that went to Senate level. And this, well, a strategy that was the recruitment and retention strategy to provide more access for black athletes. And I only wanted 90 spaces from the university. And, and, the, and the strategy was definitely not to exclude white students. I, I wanted to be clear about it. Uh, to the university, but I needed the university to understand that something needs to happen so that this picture can change. The Senate actually accepted the strategy. And post that, we then developed a transformation plan where we set clear targets over a five-year period. So from 2015, less than 10% black athletes, we ended 2018 at about 37%. And at a, at a university such as Stellenbosch, for me, that's a huge improvement. So we, we also develop a service level agreement for our coaches, our head coaches, where in that service level agreement, you need to tell me as an athletic uh, uh, director, over the next five years, how are you going to change this picture? One of the coaches asked me, um, so if I don't meet the targets, uh, what impact is this going to have on my performance bonus? I said to you, my goodness gracious, I think you need to be worried about your job, not about your performance bonuses. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, so we're going to bring up our other two uh, panelists, and then we'll continue the conversation about transformation. So Daniel and Howard, come on back up. Hey, I know. I was thinking the same thing. But we'll, find, we'll pull up two chairs. We'll make it happen. Yep, 
That's part of the issue. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Just try not to block you and try not to fall over the back. Yeah, be careful. Hello. Does this work? Yep. Yes. Imagine losing your job for not hiring black people <laughs> exactly, in America. Exactly, right? So <laughs> when we talk about this, how, you know, how do you make a change? And we say, can you really make a change? You know, you can, you can hear why this was eye-opening for me. You know, I, what if we had done this in America to begin with, right? What if we could think about it differently? So when, I, when I'm looking now in, in England, um, and I, I spoke with a, with a new colleague, and we talked about athlete activism. And one of the things that he told me was, you probably won't ever see it uh, in England because the athletes are developed at such a young age through these academies that they're company people, right? So they're, that's what they are, and, and they know. Um, but is, does that, is that your take? Is that, is that why maybe we don't hear much about it? Or maybe is there athlete activism going on? You know? I, th I think it's a, 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 um, an accurate take. I, I think that to make a comparison between England and, and the US, I, don't, I didn't think, I'm, I may change that, but I didn't think we would, we, we would start to see the level of activism around race in the, in the UK, particularly in soccer, that we have seen here. Perhaps partly because of the idea of, of being the company person, of coming through the, the system, but also because I think perhaps some players in, in, in England, in the UK, didn't feel that there was a movement behind them, mm -hmm. a, a broader social movement, which would give them the validation um, and, and support. And, you know, desperately, problematically, w we've heard tales of, of um, players of colour who would say, we wouldn't even report racism because no one's going to do anything about it. And then we're... Um, then constructed as sort of risky bodies where the people people don't want to come to, the sponsors don't want to talk to. Um, but I think that is potentially changing. Yeah. So when I start by saying, I didn't think it could happen, I think there is potential. Yeah. And so w when you're thinking about potential, who are you thinking, what are you seeing now um, that gives you, makes, gives you a different outlook? Well, there's a couple of, of, of players um, I, I will come to talk about, but I'd like to talk very briefly um, about a, another former player, a retired player, who I think is incredibly important in this um, movement or, or this move towards activism. And this is a, a retired player called Howard Gale. And I would imagine that most people in here don't know who Howard Gale is. Um, he was the first black player to play for Liverpool Football Club in 1980. He had a fairly modest career, did play in the US for a little bit with Dallas, um, but, you know, a, a modest career. He went on to become an anti-racist ambassador for an anti-racist organisation, and in 2016, as part of the, the Queen's um, honours, um, Gail was awarded what's called an MBE, and that's what refers to as member of the order of the British <laughs> Empire. And all sorts of people take them, turn them down. In sport, people have turned them down, but it tends to be people in sport turn them down because they think they're worthy of something better. <laughs> so I'm kind of waiting for the knighthood. <laughs> but what Gail said was, I can't accept this award because his, his parents were from Sierra Leone, and from Ghana, he said, I can't take this award because my ancestors would be turning in their graves because of what empire did to my people. Yeah. And what's so interesting about Gale as well is that he comes from Liverpool. And Liverpool, mm. you might know as you know, the Beatles uh, and that kind of place. <coughs> but Liverpool made its wealth on slavery. Yeah. Yeah. So you may know the, the song Penny Lane, Penny Lane by the Beatles. That's a song about a slave owner. It's a road which is named after a slave owner. So someone like Gail, in a quite a sort of everyday quotidian act of, of rejection, I think kind of sets the ball rolling. Yeah. 
Now we have the two players I, I would want to refer to. Um, one in the men's game, and that's Raheem Sterling. And one in the women's game, and that's Eniola Aluko. And they're both players who, in different ways, have, have called out the racism of the media and of, of the Football Association itself. Yeah. And, and those are definitely folks to, to Google if you're, you're not aware. Alex Scott, as we talked about too, um, after her career and, and a part of the media and you know being talked over by a, a white male counterpart and her response to that. And so I, I do feel like maybe there's a global movement up front. Someone mentioned earlier LeBron and taking picture with, with Caster and, mm -hmm. and how maybe there's, there's something else going. You know, so we struggled, Howard, at the Institute at one point trying to, to wrap our arms around athlete activism. And I remember Ken and I talking, trying to create a timeline and putting up names and so on. And we had to decide what constitutes athlete activism. So in your current book, how are you defining athlete activism and how would we distinguish what is simply a response perhaps versus what is an actual activist? Yeah, and that's a great question. And that, and especially now with the commercialism, as we yeah. were talking about in the in the earlier panel, there is a movement on the part of the leagues and the teams and the corporations to profit off of patriotism. Right. And now there's a movement on the part of the corporations and the players and such to profit off of protest. Right. So neither one of these things should be for sale, but yet they both are front and center when it comes to right. athletics. Right. To me, I always look at it this way. What are you losing? What are you risking? Are you risking something? Are you putting something on the line? Are, are you selling? I mean, do you really get to join the pantheon of uh, Lee and Carlos for wearing a t-shirt? Is, is that where we are right now? Right. Um, if it is, I'm really frightened. Um, but on the other hand, somebody, when we talked about the, the, the split with the football players, with the Players Coalition versus the Kaepernick wing, uh, is, is Malcolm Jenkins a member of this heritage, whereas Colin Kaepernick definitely is? And, and, I, and, and once again, I think that the distinction that I make is risk. I think it's one thing to fight for mass incarceration. I think that's. I think it's a good thing. I think it's an admirable thing. I think it's very different to risk your livelihood for it. And I think that is one of the, the big differences. And I think that when we were talking, and you were talking earlier, the enormous financial pressure that is on these athletes to risk their livelihood. Yeah. And that is such a thing that we, you know, you don't, this is, one of the things I, I say is that heritage is not something you want to be a part of. I mean, look at what happened to these guys. Look at what happened to Jackie Robinson. We put him on stamps. We put him on schools and everything. Jackie Robinson was never even offered a job in baseball after he retired. Right. Do you really want to live the life that Tommy and, and John lived? Do you really want to go through what Ali went through? It's not something that, that you say, yeah, sign me up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's, there's a price that needs to be paid, for, that, that has to be paid for this. All right. It looks like I got a couple of questions, so let's, let's start here. Um, women make up 40% of athletes, yet get less than 2% of airtime on sport networks. Should women use activism to get visual representation in the media? Um, and I, I think, Ilham, I want to take a twist on this a little bit. Who would you consider to be the leading sports figure in South Africa right now? I'm hoping you give me the answer. Definitely, Mohadi Kasasamenya. Yes. And so, what we we are we're kind of on the outside, perhaps, of knowing where Castor is right now. But what? What's going on with Castor and Castor's case? Uh, well, I, I, it so happens that I am in close contact with uh, some of her team members. And um, one of them said um, when they went to, to the, the court for arbitration and sport, um, one of the comments she made was that she, not, she really understands how complicated this matter is. And what that means to me is an extremely matured way and how she looks at what she's currently dealing with. But having said that, um, fast transformation, having mentioned the six dimensions, Scott, right in the center of this is the aspect of human rights. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what this is all about for us. Mm -hmm. It is about her human right as an individual and as a nation 
we are saying enough is enough. Yeah. Yeah. Even some of the, the comments, um, the IOC and all of these international bodies who tell you to keep politics out of sport, it ain't happening in my country. <laughs> politics are right in there. Yeah. And we do make it our business. Yeah. Yeah. And she certainly is playing a leading role in changing the narrative. Right. So were the United Nations four days ago right. who decided to back her, mm -hmm. um, calling this rule humiliating, yeah. it shows you the power of sport. Yes. And I think as a, as a woman and as, a, as, a, as, a, as an individual, as a human being, that have, she grew up in the, in the rural areas. She decided to do something that she's passionate about. Mm -hmm. We know her quite well in the university sports space environment. Last year at the National University Championships, um, my athlete um, came second, she came first, and I asked Justine, do you think she held back? Justine said, definitely not. Not the way I feel right now. <laughs> so that perception. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of women and media, I do believe that you need the casters yeah. so that we can change the narrative. Absolutely. But perhaps as women, we should just stop going to the grocery stores. We should stop going to the, you know, the uh, retail stores. And because I think in most instances we hold the purse, and we can get people to to focus a little bit more on on what's important for women as well. Yeah. Trying to look at the issue of media. So food deprivation. You're saying if we <laughs> if w if women controlling the, the money, say, hey, I'm not going anywhere yeah. until we handle this business. Yeah, and then Maybe you men will, will stand up and say, look after the woman. <laughs> Good deal. All right, so as, as we think of where we are, right, and where we've fallen short, it seems like, and I'm thinking about kind of the whole day, right, we've got how in terms of leadership, we've, we've, we've got people in some places, but there's a question of, of the culture, question of whether or not there's, there's really going to be uh, sustainable change. Um, I want each of you to maybe reflect on uh, this idea of sustainability. What would it take f for there to be sustainability of, these, of this movement um, of athlete activism and change in social justice where you are? So in Europe and in UK, what would it take? Yeah, great question. Um, I, I think that what we would require in, in the UK is to sort of get over a tipping point. Okay. And I think we're still some way from a tipping point where some of this sort of behavior and action becomes sort of normalized. Okay. Now, one of the players I mentioned earlier is uh, Raheem Sterling, who, if you'd said to me some years ago, you know, who is going to be the perhaps the player in, in the um, EPL who's going to have a big effect, I wouldn't have said Sterling. Mm. I really wouldn't have said Sterling. I'm not sure who it would be, but I don't think it would be Sterling. But Sterling, he's a player who has been hugely, hugely demonized by <laughs> opposition fans, um, demonized by the media, um, and there's a perhaps an interesting wider context I, I won't go into now, about the broader demonization of, of Jamaican communities in the UK under uh, Theresa May's so-called hostile environment and the scandal around um, uh, the despicable treatment of the so-called Windrush uh, generation of, of migrants. But Sterling has very calmly and eloquently started to challenge the racism of the media. And what we started to see is a few other players popping up and saying, kind of, I'm Spartacus too. Right. You know, I feel the same. I'm going to move with you. So I think there's some gradual movement. But what's also interesting is I think that Sterling chose to call out the media, mm -hmm. rightly so, because the media spend all their time demonizing him for his house, for his girlfriend, for his tattoo of, uh, of an M16 on his, on his leg. But I'm not sure when we would get to a, 
maybe a place where people would be more critical of the institutions of sport itself. Now, we do have that in the women's game, where we've seen Eniola Aluko, uh, who is a, a, a British footballer but now plays in Italy, challenging the, the institutional racism of the governing body. But to give a kind of, of example where we aren't seeing the challenging of the institutions, uh, eight years ago, we had two incidents of on-pitch racism in, in the EPL in the same week. And one of the recipients was the brother of Rio Ferdinand, who was a famous England player. And Rio Ferdinand and some other players of colour started um, a kind of reaction where they wanted to boycott um, or, or challenge the work of the, of the anti-racist organisation, kick it out. And I'm not sure that Kick It Out was the right target. They were kind of an easy target because they um, oversee the, the, the week of action and, and that they're a visible presence. But really, I think the target should have been the Football Association, who were absolutely um, you know, insipid in their challenging of racism. Um, so I think what Sterling, what Aluko are doing is absolutely important. But I'm, I'm not sure we're at that sort of tipping point um, where this kind of behaviour becomes normalised and part of the everyday culture of, of, of soccer and, and fandom. Yeah, and challenging the institutionalised racism, right. you say. Absolutely. Come on. So I think um, across the globe we have the necessary policies or rules and regulations that, that do make a difference. I think some things we did right, and, and I think where the failure is, is the voice of the athlete. <coughs> and I think really that's where athletes can make a difference. Because if you are not part of that policy development, uh, the practice of the policy, and that brings me to the issue of the people, the leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, the people that are making the decisions on your behalf, do they really understand you? And I think it's Todd who spoke about looking at this human, this person, and the role that he or she can play versus just looking at the end result. That's everything is about winning. And then it's about the, the general practices that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Uh, uh, back in South Africa, one uh, particular um, activity that happened it was called Fill Up uh, Potch. And this is an athletic stadium up in the north. And this was as a result of the athletes feeling that things were not done in an appropriate manner. And that stadium was packed. So they used social media to achieve that. Mm -hmm. And I think the last issue is around performance. Yeah. And without the athletes, there's nothing. And, and that's exactly what, what I believe is missing in the whole system around activism and the role of athletes. Um, I, I sometimes get irritated. I, I look at myself when I was 18-year-old and being a student activist and what we've achieved to lead us to a democratic South Africa. And I'm asking, why are you quiet? Why don't you stand up and make your voices heard? So a couple of years ago, our Olympic organization decided that our students cannot participate in the World Student Games because there were issues related to athletics uh, back home. You know what we did? Uh, I was the chairperson of the first vice president of University Sports South Africa at the time. We withdrew our membership. We told our Olympic body, bye-bye, and we left for the competition. South Africa ended up being the second best team mm. at that competition mm. because the athletes also told us, enough is enough. Yeah. We are not doing this. You are sitting in boardrooms, making decisions on our behalf, and they actually tested our leadership. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the kind of practices that I'm talking about. Yeah. Because ultimately, if we have, well, I called it the, the four Ps, imagine the, the possibilities. Right. So the voice of the athletes are critical. Without the athletes, we have nothing. Howard? Yeah, I think that it's two things. I, and I, I really like what Ilhan said as well. I think it's a leadership, number one. Because I think that leadership, they're, they're making the decisions for what's happening here. I mean, you talk about you know, the, the, the godfather. Who's controlling the strings? And, and I think that the biggest thing that is happening, at least in, in this country, certainly, is that everyone's being lied to. I think you've got the players who clearly have to do something. They've got to make their voices heard, which is why the powerful players are so important. 
But the other thing too is that you are in a you are in the middle right now of a battle. There's a fight going on right now. There's a fight going on from the organizational bodies to silence athletes. They're trying, they're actively trying to silence athletes. It's not like, oh, well, you know, the player can talk and then, or maybe not. No, 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 the, the, the leagues do not want athletes to speak. And if you're talking about owners versus players, we're talking about labor, we're talking about human rights, you're talking about all these things. These guys and these women who play, they are disposable. They are treated as disposable. They are being told that if you do anything to jeopardize what you have, not only are you jeopardizing what you have, but in especially in a socioeconomic standpoint, being the one who made it, you're jeopardizing generations. You need to be grateful for what you have right now because we can take it all away from you. And so when you place that sort of economic pressure on people, you're trying to destroy them. You're trying to control them. And that's what's happening in this country, especially. Yeah. And the reason why it's really happening is because we're not as media. Media is also part of this. Media is also trying to silence the athlete. Because we don't place any pressure on the political underpinnings of the owners themselves. They are actively giving money to causes that silence athletes. They're doing everything they can to make sure that the player does nothing but play. That's what they want the player to do. They don't want the player to have equity. They don't want the player to have, you know, when we talk about placing this in language in terms of the level playing field and all, they don't want any of that. That's why you have to fight. That's why Harry Edwards always says, at the end of everything he does, there are no final victories. So you have to recognize that there's nothing passive about what's taking place right now. They're attacking you. You have to decide if you're going to be part of this. And even if you decide that you're not part of it, you're still part of it. You're just not playing. You're just getting stomped on. All right. Well, thank you so much. I know we could spend more time, and I, I hope others seek you out and, and get to speak with you more. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I was jumping the gun to, to say that uh, we're going to talk about the, the transition uh, to our theme for, for next year, and then we're, we're getting closer to our, our closing reception. But, but as, as, as Tori's research displayed, what, what we're beginning uh, to look at is sport and, and the body. And you can think about, uh, she certainly uh, delivers to us a, a great racial connection there, so we're not moving too far away. And what we plan to look at during the course of the year, and then we'll have an event similar to this one, uh, but if you follow us on Global Sport Matters, you'll begin to see a lot of the work and, and research that we're doing in this area and, and begin to pull together. Um, what we're gonna look at are the cultural and societal implications. So those would include the female body, as, as was just discussed there, uh, body image, uh, different scrutiny for females compared to males, uh, but also other issues, high-tech prosthetics, uh, transgender athletes. Um, so we'll look at sport in the body through a lot of different ways, the, the ways that we have thus far, but we'll also try to incorporate much more uh, photography, uh, uh, films, uh, literature, art, so, so in those sorts of paths too. And one of our goals has been to incorporate the entire university and every discipline we can. So you can imagine how sport in the body is going to allow us to do a bit more of that. Um, finally, we're going to look at the pure competition aspects of the body as well. So think of the training aspects, the nutrition aspects, uh, the health pieces. Uh, how bodies have changed over time, especially related to different sports. Think of the, the gymnasts, basketball players, football players, and those sizes. So uh, we, at the reception, we entertain your thoughts on this. We certainly want to hear uh, whatever it is you might think we should be looking at in the coming year. So, so that, that's where we'll be headed in um, over the course of, of the next year. And we're fortunate, I guess, for our, our final transition to Yeah, I don't know, Robert. Robert, you need a lot of chairs, or what? I don't. Know. <laughs> I got a big button. <laughs> that 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 is sport in the body. So so 
Uh, let, let, let me at least give you uh, a bit of an appropriate int int introduction. So, uh, as you can see, assistant professor in the Department of Clinical Research and Leadership at George Washington University. I, I think, and, and those of you that have been kind of walking through, through the hallways, you, you know, and many of you may have heard of his great work, um, Not for Long, The Life and Career of an NFL Athlete. So, um, uh, Robert's been kind enough to, to, to come here to, to give us kind of these closing comments, which in my mind, the perfect transition from, from this race space to, to the body space. Robert, thank you. Any chair you want. <laughs> um, thank you so very much. You don't have any idea, really. I'm, a lot of people have come up and said how fortunate they feel to be here. Probably there's no one here that feels more fortunate than me. I just really thank Ken and Scott. When, I, when this, this invitation came in my email box, I just couldn't believe it. I was so excited. And so now I'm really, really nervous. And I hope that you'll you know, welcome me in a way that I can ease my way through this. Um, and I, Because I also realized that the only thing standing between you and uh, happy hour is me for the next 15, 20 minutes. So I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I possibly can. Um, you know, so when they, when they invited me here, uh, it was really a challenge because they said, really, we want, we think that your work, we want you to talk about how, um, the transition from what we focused on this year, which is, um, race and sports around the globe to, um, sports in the body. And I thought, wow, well, why would they ask me? Right. And I thought, well, what would they want me to talk about? I had no idea. And then I thought, well, I guess they want me to talk about my work. And then the more that I thought about it, I guess my work really does talk about race um, and the body, right? It talks about race and sports and as well as the body. So I'm gonna just, what my goal here today is, hopefully I can remember to keep this thing moving. Um, my goal here today is really, I'm gonna be kind of an apologetic, apologist to get people to do research around these ideas of the body. What I am is I am a, uh, I'm a medical sociologist, and my training is in biobehavioral health disparities research, right? Big mouthful. Um, but um, my focus on that is aging. And one of the areas that I'm really concerned with and really think a lot about is how do athletes age, right? Because, um, you know, we know that what we do, these amazing things with their bodies, and I'm particularly interested in how do athletes age cognitively, particularly those athletes that have been exposed to concussive events. So what I'm going to do is uh, today in the brief time that I have is I'm going to speak very quickly, uh, give you a kind of a little bit of an overview uh, of my book project. And the reason I'm going to talk about that mainly is because there was a lot of books. It's, it's really interesting because I was very surprised and, and really fortunate that the book has been very well received. But the one area that people have said to me is, you know, the book would have been so much better if you didn't talk about race, right? And I, and I thought, well, you know, when I was in graduate school and I was doing this work on NFL athletes and their transition to life after football, I was told that there were two things that you have to talk about. Well, actually three. They said, you got to tell your own personal story. And so that's what I did. So I wanted to make sure that I was talking about this story in the book. Um, my story, which I didn't want to do because I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted to bring athletes' own voices out into the story. But the other thing that I was told is because the NFL is 70% black and, br and brown, right? They said, you got to talk about race. There's no way that you can talk about the NFL and NFL athletes without talking about race. And the other thing that they told me is I really, really needed to talk about, and I wanted to stay away from it, but was gender as well. So I have chapters in there about um, how athletes from their own voices, how they experience um, race and what their thoughts around masculinity and those kinds of things were. And so my book project really is essentially comes from this idea is I wanted to find out how do athletes transition to their life after football, right? And I wanted to understand from athletes in their own perspective, what does it mean to be an NFL athlete? And so when asking those questions, what does it mean to, you know, how do you transition out? I wanted to look at those people that had struggles because we hear all of these different um, problems that athletes have. We've talked about, you know, it's almost pathologized that the NFL athletes, they go broke, they're divorced, their bodies are broken and all these other things, right? And so there's a difficulty in that transition out. But then there's also some success stories. And so I think that hopefully what I capture is voices of people who actually have told you and can share with you some of the ways um, by which their 
identities weren't um, kind of unidimensional and only adopted the uh, athletic role, but they saw themselves as some other different things. But for me today, uh, what's relevant to this conversation is I want to talk about how athletes experience race in the NFL, right? And so my project was a, a four-year ethnographic um, project. I was trained as, I'm a medical sociologist, but I was trained as an ethnographer, much like uh, my brother Scott back there, right? So I spent four years in the field. I lived with athletes. I interviewed athletes. I, I really tried to understand the difference, what meaning making was like for athletes. What is the difference between what they say and what they do? How do they understand the world? How do the world around them understand them? I wanted to look at their intimate relationships with their, parent, with their parents, with their wives, their siblings, their children, their coaches, all of those things to understand the world of the athlete. And so it consisted of 140 um, interviews over a four-year period. And then after I came out of the field, I was able to then go into the classroom and look at some athletes from there because I really wanted to understand the transitions, the guys from junior high school to high school, and then high school to college, and then from college to the pros, and then ultimately the transition out of the NFL, right? Because that's the one thing that's pretty doggone unique about the NFL sports is that 95% of us have traveled along the same exact path. There's a few like Antonio Gates who played basketball and then found their way into the NFL. But most of us start from a very, very young age when someone looks at us directly into the eye and says, you are special. You got what it takes. And when that happened to me, believe me, that validation that I was looked that I got at that point, I would do anything to keep that coming for the rest of my life, even though I grew up with a very well two family household. But it was something about those men and my colleagues saying to me, you matter because of this sport. Right. And so that's what I tried to capture with the book. Um, so now. Of course, I'll just go over that real quickly, but one of the things that we have to remember here that was so prominent and so important is that you have, the NFL is in fact the largest employer of black male athletes in this country, right? Um, and there's a significant over-representation of black men in the NFL, where it's about 6% in all the population and there's 70% or so uh, with the numbers we've heard is even, maybe even a little bit higher. And um, Scholars, particularly like our good friend uh, Harry Edwards, said he argues that the overrepresentation uh, of black youths developing a single-minded purpose uh, in kind of in the framework of upward mobility of sports that that has hurt the black you know community. And so I wanted to kind of understand what that, and it's kind of within that, it, you know, this whole idea is compounded by even further is that there are so many white men who are owners of the, the teams. I, I actually like to say there's actually a, a, um, an Asian woman who is an owner of a team, which is really important. The Buffalo Bills are owned by um, a white male and an Asian female, and we know that the Jacksonville Jaguars are owned by an Asian man. So um, the black athletes that I encountered, they're generally kind of employed uh, one of two different types of strategies to deal with racial issues in the league. And the one uh, that maybe is some people find the most controversial, but although it's situated in some literature, is they take a, a black nationalism or Afrocentric approach, which really, it appeals to a smaller group, but basically they're willing to vocalize their thoughts and ideas. Um, and then there's the racial integrationist. Uh, and this strategy is, and that kind of more resonates with a, a larger um, group of people. And it's really kind of interesting because I wrote about this and I borrowed from Patricia Hill Collins' work, who's a sociologist, and how she talks about these two different frames. And I wrote this a lot way before, years before the Colin Kaepernick thing. And it's made me kind of think about situating like where is he, Colin Kaepernick, and where is Ed Reed, and where is Malcolm Jenkins and some other the athletes, and how do they think about race and how do they approach race uh, in, in terms of their pursuits in the NFL. But um, so particularly for the African-American athlete, instead of viewing it as a, a, a political attitude, uh, they draw on black nationalism for its meaning that it offers in their everyday lives. So in other words, they see the world kind of through this nationalism lens. This group kind of believes that black nationalism or Afrocentrism is an effective strategy of fight against racist owners um, that are intent on exploiting and marginalizing black bodies. 
right? So the, the, the criticism to them is that they see the whole world as racialized and they're willing to stand up and fight the power on anything. And then, um, so shortly after I began my field research, I discovered that uh, the black nationalists or the Afrocentric athletes are further apportioned into two smaller subgroups ideologically. And certain members in that camp, they kind of claim that black athletes must unite and fight against the white establishment. And then others basically kind of argue that the historic legacy of, um, of slavery keeps African Americans from, they're fractured and, and they're kind of like the whole, you've heard the argument, crabs in a barrel, right? But they still believe in the Afrocentrism, but they say this is why black people can't own nothing and can't do nothing because they're always fighting against one another. So that's kind of what I found through the athletes in their own voices that I spoke with. And then, of course, there's what I've argued is that there are those athletes who adhere to the racial integrationist model that tend to downplay race as a factor that negatively affects his life um, after football. So they don't see, they don't, you know, really, I wouldn't say they pre don't pretend that they don't see it, but they believe that, you know, essentially integrating into society is a great benefit for them or integrating into full, into sports. So the racial integrationist is deeply committed to the notion that failure is not really an option and that most black integrationists believe that the same dedication uh, and perseverance that propelled them to the NFL is exactly what it's going to um, take to succeed in every other aspect of their lives, right? So they kind of take that as a guiding principle for themselves. So ultimately, the racial integration, uh, Grayson, as he feels responsible for whatever happens in his life, um, and as an NFL alumni, the racial integrationist refuses to be considered a victim of racial discrimination either during their career or after they retire. And one of the things that I felt was so interesting about that is I had a conversation with a former football player that now lives in Los Angeles, played with the Dallas Cowboys. And you know, he came from inner city Los Angeles and he made comments about, so, so to speak, he said, you know, like for instance, some black folks are their own worst enemies, driving, sell, selling drugs, driving around in big cars. And I said to him, I said, you know, that, that kind of um, statement is what people really got on um, Bill Cosby for at the time, if you remember way before his problems that he has now, but before he, he kind of told, you know, black folks, y'all need to stop behaving in a certain way and you'll get much farther in life. And um, this brother said, well, listen, I, I, listen, I, I grew up in this, this environment and I see that sometimes folks are their own worst enemies, but if you work hard and you do what you need to do, you'll get ahead, right? So these are just kind of some of the ways that I think that they experience and saw race, and I go into much more detail into this in the book, obviously, because I'm talking very fast, and I need to try to cover as much as I possibly can. But this is really kind of how some of them experience this. And so I think this quote from an integrationist perspective is really kind of important. And this is from Marcus, who's a former um, Philly, you know, Phoenix Cardinal kick returner and wide receiver. And what he said, he said, listen, I am sure that racism exists in the NFL, uh, just like it does everywhere else in society. Um, and you can't worry about that, though, or else you'll be kicked out of the league in a hurry. It's your job to play football, and everything else will take care of itself. He says, so I don't spend too much time thinking about race at all. And so the reason that I think, if just thinking about NFL athletes for a moment, thinking about their experiences, think about their everyday reality, I'm going to give you two examples that have happened that I try to highlight in the book that happened not too long ago, not too distant past, and I mean within five years or eight years or something like that, but how this exp it, this is really kind of the everyday, the reality that they live in when they're thinking about how to negotiate race in the NFL. So some of you may re remember uh, Des Bryant, and when he was coming out of college, he was the you know the phenom. He was everything coming out of Oklahoma State, and so he was projected to be a top five pick. And so he went, you know, did they the tour around the different leagues? And, and I believe it's Jeff Ireland, um, who was at the time the general manager of the Miami Dolphins, and at the time, he said to Dez, he said, so during their interview, trying to figure out whether they're going to interview him or not, but during their interview, he said to him, he said, so I understand, I hear that your mother is a prostitute, 
What do you have to say about that? She's a drug addict and a prostitute. Well, think about being at this time a 21 year old man and having to answer that in, in your dreams and in, in the realities of what it is that you're looking for and looking a hope to. So your first entree into the NFL is this racialized space. How many people have to defend you know, what their mother's actions are and, and talk about, particularly in black folks, what your mama is like, right? So that's a real issue for him. And then. A couple years later, two, three years um, ago, Eli Apple, three, four years ago, maybe y'all remember this, Eli Apple came out of Ohio State, African-American defensive back, and there was um, a, a scout from the, uh, uh, what was it, the Atlanta Falcons had said to him, he said, we get reports, we hear that you're a homosexual. How do you, what do you have to say about that? Right? And so here, again, we know that that's about race, that's about genders, all of these things all wrapped up into one where he's trying to figure out as young men, how do I make sense of this? How do I answer this? How do I deal with this kind of thing? And so that's really kind of what I try to do in the book is to show people how to deal with that, how these athletes themselves experience that. I see this thing is quick, is, is moving very quickly. Um, so I'm going to do my best. Okay, so the discovery of you know football players, uh, they, they use to complete these strategies to address, address the racial dynamics in the NFL led me to consider, of course, how does race affect athletes during their retirement? And again, Afrocentric athletes are skeptical and distrustful of the white-owned establishments, and black athletes who subscribe to the Afrocentrism strongly believe that the white owners are you know just this this um, exploitative thing? So those things I think have a very strong impact on how they see the world and how, if you think about it, how it will affect even maybe your mental health when you transition to out of football. So. My work, as I mentioned, I do biobehavioral health disparities research. And within this, what I try to do as an interdisciplinary researcher, my training from the National Institute of Aging, is I try to look at how biology and how the social parameters, as well as the psycho psychological kind of parameters, how they all come together in that intersection and affect people's neurocognitive aging, particularly over the life course. So within the, the kind of buckets or the fields that I'm in here is, you know, again, drawing from ethnography, mixed methods, psychosocial, gerontology, and ultimately I'm trying to understand that how do people age. So this, real quickly, I got three and a half minutes, I'm going to try to just share with you on the other end, again, the body, because what I'm looking at, and we know that many people who are neurologists and others are looking at kind of the pathology of the injured brain, what happens to the physical injured brain. I'm really trying to understand that other part of this in the work that I do when we talk about how do people age, but how do your attitudes and your beliefs, how do they affect your behavior, particularly when it comes to your behavior for your body? How are you looking after your body when you're looking at things like um, healthcare utilization? Are you relying on when you're feeling though you have mental health issues? Are you going to mental health professionals? Are you avoiding mental health professionals? Or are you going to religious professionals? One of the things that in our work that's really important that has come out is that we found that upwards of 80% of the NFL athletes consider themselves to be religious or spiritual, right? And so how does that affect your mental health over time? That's what, those are the kind of things we try to look at. So the work that I do when it comes to the body and comes to the, to the, the mental health and the brain health, I, try to, I don't make this distinction between the physical rest of your body and then the brain. I consider, especially having been an athlete myself and playing, we know that when people experience traumatic injury in their body, it is not disconnected from a, dis, a traumatic brain injury. You're generally feeling a lot of pain and having hurts in other parts of your body. And so this uh, comment by Odessa Turner is one that really started to drive me from the work that I do with my book that I did trying to find out about the transition to life after sports to really think about these issues of brain health, Alzheimer's disease, cognitive functioning, how you age over the time, over, over your life, and looking at kind of the stress process model. But what he said was, he said, living like this is an embarrassment. Sometimes I feel like a broken down old man. Uh, my girlfriend's got to help me. She's got to repeat stuff all the time to me because I can't remember what she's said. He said, I have trouble getting off the couch, right? No, Des is only 52 years old, and he was uh, diagnosed with early uh, stage uh, um, 
Alzheimer's disease from having multiple concussions during his football career. What was quite interesting for him is people do ask, would he play football again given the injuries, given the concussions that he's had? And he would say, absolutely yes. He said, because I love the game, but first of all, also the reason I played the game in the first place is because I knew that the game was gonna check, it was gonna affect my family's financial future. So I don't have a problem with the game. What I have a problem with is the fact that the NFL lied to me all of these years. And then I had to sue the NFL for my retirement benefits and my health benefits because they kept denying me from that. So that made me start to think about, okay, this relationship between the body, playing sports, and aging. So the work that, that I did, and I'm not going to go much further dive into this because, again, the time has already come. But what I will say is that we wanted to look at the work that we're doing with this particular project and others going forward, but we wanted to understand for these young men, how do you, what is it like for men who have basically occupationally, they had to be in great health, but as an occupational hazard, they played a, a physically or they worked in a physically demanding environment. And then we know that NFL athletes, from the work that we have done, that they have not higher rates, but they have high rates of depression. They're, the rates of depression among NFL athletes was about the same as it was for, for the general male population. But what we looked at when we did our research, we found that those men who were in pain and said that they had pain, chronic pain, they were 40% more likely to report having depression. Right? And then that's really interesting and important is because NFL athletes, the whole population that we work with, 65% of NFL athletes report that they are uh, experiencing chronic pain in retirement. But what we found out was with our work and we were looking at that we wanted to look at the relationship between depressive symptoms and chronic pain. And what we found that what really mediated the relationship was not the um, pain in and of itself, but it was functional limitations or for this particular group, it was in the younger people as well. So in other words, we were asking people, do you have difficulty walking a quarter of a mile? Do you have difficulty standing for an hour or two? Do you have a problem walking up the stairs holding a bag of groceries? And interestingly enough, the older group, because when we did this research, it was divided between um, men who were 30 and 49 years old and 50 and above. We found no racial differences in terms of their, pro their rates of depression and functional limitations. But what we did find that was quite interesting is that men who were in the younger group from 30 to 49, they were much more likely to um, suffer from more functional limitations and higher rates of depression than the older group. And the younger group, because of the, the demographics of the NFL, happened to be much more, uh, much larger percentage was black. So what we're finding is that there is an aging, an accelerated aging process based on the demands and the stress and the physical activity they put on their body, which was causing them to experience depression at a much earlier age. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much. There's a whole lot more that I do cover in my book, as well as on other research. But really, I hope to leave you here today, those of you who are scholars, that you will think about how can you do the kind of work that will bring together these ideas around race and looking at the body and taking much more of a um, kind of a biomedical, uh, biopsychosocial approach to understanding. And I really do believe that the people who are most kind of, um, I guess you could say, most prepared to do this kind of work are former athletes ourselves. Okay, so thank you.